Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is entitled, God's Mission, My Mission. And this is lesson number eight in that series entitled, Mission to the Needy. And we're gonna see mission to various groups. Today it's the needy. And this is the lesson for November 25 of 2023. We should begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, the example you set for us when you came to this earth is just beyond belief. And of course, I know you don't expect us to do everything which you did, but it wouldn't it be nice? So help us to understand with our limitations how we can follow your example and reaching out to the needy is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So in this lesson, we will look at many people who had various kinds of needs. Think about the people back in Jesus' day. God is calling us to help others, and in some cases, for others to help us. This work can be very challenging. Sometimes Jesus completely healed all the sick in a village. Imagine, Gordon and I, we've talked about this before. Imagine if we could walk over to the hospital over here, just walk to the hospital and healed every single person. There's two questions I have if, if Jesus did that. The first question is, how would it be reported on the news? And secondly, what would happen the next day? Yes. He'd love to lie. <laughs> there would be lines out down the street, I'm sure. Wow. You thought baby Faye was big. Yeah. This work can be very challenging. Sometimes Jesus completely healed all the sick in a village. We do not have the ability. Who are the people in that ability? Who are the people in real need in our communities? Consider the story of the paralyzed man who was brought to Jesus and let down to the roof to him. Luke 5, 20 through 26, Jim. When Jesus saw how much faith they had, he said to the man, your sins are forgiven, my friend. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees began to say to themselves, who is this man who speaks such blasphemy. God is the only one who can forgive sins. Verse 22, Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, why do you think such things? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven you or to say, get up and walk? I will prove to you then that the Son of Man has authority on earth to give forgive sins so that, so he said to the paralyzed man, I will, excuse me, I tell you, get up, pick up your bed, and go home. Uh, there's a, I want to interrupt for just a second. There's a couple things we miss if we don't understand something about Hebrew and Aramaic. When Jesus said, the Son of Man, you notice it's capitalized. That word, the way, if you say someone is a human being, in Hebrew or Aramaic, you say, son of a human being. That means human being. So Jesus is saying, I'm a human being, and at the same time, they were saying, who is this man? This is one of, the goodest, one of the good verses for saying that Jesus was fully and completely human. Okay, go ahead. Uh, verse 25, at once the man got up in front of them and took the bed he had been lying on and went home praising God. They were all completely amazed. Full of fear, they praised God saying, what marvelous things we have seen today. American Bible Society, Good News Translation. And what were the Pharisees and the scribes say? Blasphemy. <laughs> they must have really... They didn't know how to handle this. Yeah, they this absolutely they not. They wanted to know how Jesus did that trick. Yeah. Right. One and thing, one thing. Uh, the four friends were not hanging on to the ropes. They drop the ropes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so he picked up the bed and the walk. So. Yeah. Yes. In order to fully understand the implications of this story, we must understand their beliefs about sickness. It was a common belief that sickness was a direct result of some sin committed either by the person himself or by his or her parents. You remember the other story we're going to look at in just a moment. Therefore, it was their understanding that in order for the, for the sickness to be healed, what had to happen? The sin must be forgiven. That is why Jesus first forgave the man, then healed him. So who had, who had the ability to uh, forgive sins other than God, yeah. Jesus? So how did anyone get healed? 
Well, uh, uh, what they would have said is God blessed them and he healed them. Now, you're, they're not saying that somebody, some other person has to bless you or do something to forgive. They believe that the people got well is because God, they did something good and God blessed them and then they were healed. But here's a person who's, who's been sick for a long, long time and Jesus says, healed, uh, that, that was, no, I guess, I, I guess I'm good today, I can get up. <laughs> Go ahead, Dwayne. John 9, 1 and 2. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been born blind. His disciples asked him, Teacher, whose sin caused him to be born blind? Was it his own or his parents' sin? So there's the verse to suggesting that uh, any, any problem you have is a result of some sin that either you or your parents committed. So do the people in your community, now we're talking about us. Do the people in our communities need help physically, emotionally, financially, even socially? Could we as members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church to reach out to, these, to those people? Has God called us to do that? Can we do it safely? I mean, in some of the Adventist uh, printings of late, the very thing. Yeah. What can we learn from the story of the paralyzed man? Gordon? From the Bible study guide, it says, by bringing their friend to Jesus, these men took on the responsibility to care for him. God is calling us to be like this man's friends, to lead the needy to Jesus Christ. This work requires faith, <clears throat> action, patience, and a willingness, if need be, to be unconventional. Okay, what do we have to do to be unconventional? Be like many I of can't us are. command what? Be like many of us are. Yeah. Well, who was it that had faith in this case? Was it the man, the men who carried the man to Jesus, or the paralyzed man himself, or both? All of them had. All of them. Yes. It's more to tear up someone's roof. Uh, yeah. Come on. <laughs> yeah. What these men did seems quite amazing to us. Could we do something like that today? From the writings of Ellen White, do not wait to be told your duty. Open your eyes and see who are around you. Make yourselves acquainted with the helpless, afflicted, and needy. Hide not yourselves from them and seek not to shut out their needs. Who gives the proofs mentioned in James of possessing uh, pure religion, untainted with selfishness and corruption? Who are they anxious to do all their power to aid in the great plan of salvation? Ellen White testimonies for the church body. And what does it say in James 1.27? Pure religion and undefiled yes. is to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and keep himself pure unspotted from the world. Unspotted from the world, right, right. Okay, our Bible study guide, another spot goes on. Jesus himself demonstrates how to help the helpless and is calling us to do the same. I mean, this lesson is really challenging us. First, we become their friends, then we learn about their needs, and finally, we lead them to Jesus, who is the only one who can help them. This is what the men in this story did. They, we, we need to do likewise if what, in whatever situation we find ourselves, help lead people to the only one who can save them, Jesus. Have we missed church uh, because we stopped to help someone? Well, that's a big order. If you think of all the people who are in need out there, have you acquired any friends specifically for the purpose of leading them to Jesus? I can think of a few examples in my past. Think of another story from the life of Jesus. John 5, 1 through 10. After this, Jesus went to Jerusalem for a religious festival. Near the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem, there's a pool with five porches. In Hebrew, it is called Beth Zatha. Um, well, I won't go into all the details of that, but anyway, it, I'm sure it was Beth Zatha, not Beth Seda, like the King James says. A large crowd of sick people are lying in the porches, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. And the footnote says, going on, some manuscripts add verses 3b and 4, 
think about this part that's not in the original document. They were waiting by the water, they were waiting by the water to move because every now and then an angel of the Lord went down into the pool and stirred up the water. The first sick person to go into the pool after the water was stirred up was healed from whatever disease he had. Now, why do you suppose that isn't in the earliest documents? Because it's not true. Because it's not true. Yeah. But, but something was happening, though. Something was happening, exactly. Right. There wasn't an angel's turn. But here's, here, here's what li almost certainly happened here. The people who are familiar with Jerusalem, they knew about this thing and they understood this story. But the story doesn't make any sense if you don't understand this part. See, if you don't understand that they're waiting for the water to move and that, the rest of the story doesn't make any sense. Why are they, wait what are they waiting for? You know? And so someone, I'm sure, who was, realized that this story is going to be read by people who had never been to Jerusalem, he put this as a, as a note in the, in the margin of, the, in the, of, the, of whatever document he was copying. And later people said, oh yeah, that helps to make the story understandable. They just put it back in. Does that make it not inspired? It's an addition that somebody put in there. It doesn't mean it's inspired. Well, is it true? Probably not. <laughs> well, it is true. Yeah, no, it, it's it, not. Huh? It's, it's not true that the angel stirred the water. No, but it's a true representation of what actually happened. It's a true representation of well, what people not the angel, not the angel part, but the fact that the, people are waiting for the water. The plumbing system over yeah. time, is, sure. you know, they gurgles and belches. Some of the big insects jump in there and make it go out. Like what did the paralyzed man say? Let's listen to him. Yeah. A man because, was there yeah. who had been ill for 38 years. So he was, this was not an urgent case, right? Jesus saw him lying there and he knew that the man had been ill for such a long time. So I asked him, do you want to get well? And of course, Jesus knew and we know that, what day was it? It was the Sabbath. It was the Sabbath. The sick man answered, Sir, I have no one here to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. While I'm trying to get in, someone else gets there first. So what was that stirring up? So this is, the, this is the explanation of that, I'm quite sure. There were a lot of people there with imaginary diseases. And they didn't have any physical handicaps. So as soon as they saw the water moving, they were the first ones in. So of course, they believed the water was going to heal them. And so they were, quote, healed because they only had an imaginary disease to start out with. So you mean to say that there were faith healing going on at that time too, like we do sometimes in our churches? Some kind of faith yeah. healing, yes. Interesting. That was what was going on. Sometimes those diseases of the mind are the hardest to yeah. deal with. Yeah. yeah. For sure. Okay, Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. Immediately, the mat, and you know, Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. He knew what day it is. He knew what was going to happen when he told the man to pick up his mat. He picked up his mat and started walking. The day that this happened was a Sabbath. So the Jewish authorities told the man who had been healed, this is a Sabbath and it is against our law for you to carry your mat. So what do you think is going on there? Read between the lines. How many people are walking around Jerusalem who could heal a man who had been paralyzed for 38 years? <laughs> None. Only one. One. Yes. Yeah. One man. Yeah, one. So now, if you can accuse Jesus of breaking the Sabbath, you have a potential case against him, right? And they under, just misunderstood the Sabbath. And that well, was sure. at the time that they were doing the, with the, dealing with the Mishnah and the Talmud. And yeah. they're making all these rules and regulations of big, thick books, which I have copies of. Yeah. And uh, it just distorted the picture of what God is really like. Yeah, absolutely. But, but if, if you've got bean counters that are keeping track of things, they gave them a job. It's called, they call yeah. it work, creating jobs or making work. Or Ellen whatever. G. White provides a five-step process of Jesus' method and how to minister especially to those in need. Jim? Okay. E.G. E. G. White. E.G.W. there? Yeah. yeah. Okay, Christ's method alone will give the true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them, follow me. From the Ministry of Appealing, page 143. Yeah. 
Okay. What does the Bible study guide say? Carrie, you want to pick that up there? Yeah. First, we must mingle with the helpless, spend time getting to know them and understand their needs with the intention of doing good for them. Okay, where are we going to find the helpless today? Everywhere. <laughs> Everywhere. Yeah. That's about right. Second, okay. we need to show sympathy. This can be challenging. God is calling us to show sympathy without expecting anything in return. The third step is to minister to their needs. This involves more than just words. It takes action to minister to the needs of a friend or a stranger. The fourth step is winning their confidence. When we minister to people, when we help them, they will learn to trust us and what we say to them. So when we talk to them about Jesus, they would be more open to listen. Jesus didn't want just to heal them physically. He wanted them to have eternal life in him. See John 10.10. 10. The last step is to help them help lead them to Jesus, an act that requires faith from both you and the one whom you help. We generally can't do the kind of miracles that Jesus did, but what are the ways that we can still minister to those who need help? And that's uh, from that old Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Monday, November 20. And I can tell you <sighs> that, and you've heard me talk a few times about the church I was a member of, for a little while, and this was in Baltimore, Maryland, was attending, I was attending Johns Hopkins University. And this kind of stuff was happening in that church. They ran five-day plans to stop smoking every month. Almost all the church members were involved. I had a personal experience of people who just said, you know, is anything happening in your church? I said, come and see for yourself. And, you know, people with, you know, highly trained people and so forth came and said, we've never seen anything like this. Yeah. So um, it's possible in our day. So what groups of people closely resemble those, these examples that we have of Jesus? The topic of immigrants and refugees has become a hotbed, I'm sorry, hotly, hotly divided, debated subject, especially because there are so many of them today. In our day, and our culture, it is so easy to develop a group of friends with whom we share many ideas, a common language and culture, and avoid trying to reach out to others. Even their food might be different from ours. But all the way through the Bible, the message is reach out to those in need, including foreigners. What evidence do we have for that? Dwayne? Deuteronomy 10:19. So then, show love for those foreigners because you were once foreigners in Egypt. Okay. Gordon? Romans 12, 13, share your belongings with your needy fellow Christians and open your homes to strangers from the Good News Bible. And if you're familiar with the scriptures at all, you know that I picked out one verse from the Old Testament and one verse from the New Testament. These, these commands are all through the Old Testament and all through the New Testament. Well, Matthew 2, 13 to 15, remind us that Jesus and his parents were briefly refugees in Egypt. After they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph and said, Herod will be looking for the child in order to kill him. So get up, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt and stay there until I tell you to leave. Joseph got up, took the child and his mother and left during the night for Egypt, where he stayed until Herod died. This was done to make what the Lord had said through the prophet come true. I call my son out of Egypt. Goodness Bible. Now there's several things that that questions that that raises for me when I think about this story. I'm sure, considering the gifts they had received from the wise men, they were probably well supported while they were down in Egypt. That's number one. Secondly, Joseph was a very skilled carpenter, I'm sure. So I'm sure he wouldn't have had any trouble finding a job. That's the second point. Uh, this, part, this story is important because it gives us a clue about when Jesus was born. 
because it means Herod was still alive and we know when Herod died. So those are several important points that are just incidental here. But what about Jesus, jo Joseph's other children? Look at Matthew 13, 55 and 56. Hold on, let me just go back there and you can see it easier over here. Um, isn't he the carpenter's son? Isn't Mary his mother? And aren't James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas his brothers? Aren't all his sisters living here? Where did he get all this? So how many sisters did Jesus have? Last time I ever heard it. Two at least. Is at least two. Why do we know absolutely nothing about his sisters? Well, we know almost nothing about most women who are in the Bible. Yeah, that's true. It was part of their culture for the women to be almost meaningless. Wow. What are the biggest challenges of trying to reach out to the immigrants and refugees in our society? Well, the Bible study guide said <laughs> the first thing you need to do is start praying. Begin with prayer. In Luke 4, 18, remember what happened in Luke 4? Jesus went back to Nazareth for the last time. Actually, I think there was one more time after this. And what did they ask him to do? Jesus returned to Nazareth sometime after he had become famous for his miracles and his teachings. And what was the normal course of events in the in a Sabbath in the in the synagogue? Read the scripture. Someone reads the scripture, and then sits someone down. sits down and tries to explain what it's all about. Okay, we don't have time to go through that whole story, but you remember. Jesus read Luke 4, and it, quoting from Isaiah 60, and then he sat down and he quoted all the parts of the text except the part that they wanted to hear. We need to realize that the entire crowd of people listened to Jesus were waiting for him to reach the part that they loved, as it says in Isaiah 61, I'm sorry, not 60, 61 verse 2, and defeat their enemies, the, the Romans. So they were waiting. They didn't care about taking care of the needy or the blind or any of those kinds. All they cared about was beating the Romans. And they believed that's what the Messiah was going to do for them. How often do we seek new friends primarily for the purpose of winning them to God? That's something we do. We must get over our discomfort with other people's customs and ways. Um, Customs and ways are pretty important in society, some societies particularly. Think about the woman recently who was killed by the police because she wasn't wearing her hijab in Iran. The war, she was wearing it, just not the way she was supposed to wear it. She was arrested and ended up being beaten and killed. Well, try to imagine yourself as a refugee in some country that you have never been to before. How would you feel if someone befriended you and was nice and helped you in many ways to make your life more comfortable and safe? So now, when the busloads of refugees from Texas or Arizona arrive in Los Angeles, should we be down there meeting them? It's a hard one to call in a way. They shouldn't have been there in the first place. Well, we're not talking about whether they should or shouldn't have been there. The question is, are they needy? Do they need help? Well, if you look, they're, they're paying them more than, than most people on Social Security getting. And besides that, plus uh, room and board, so. Yeah, well, that's the second question. The question is, what is Jesus asking us to do? Back there, that, that verse from Romans, Romans 12, 13, I think it was. That, that's a that's a tall order. It is. That <laughs> I'm sorry, my wife would have a hard time with that one. Yeah. Jesus took his message of being nice to widows, children, nor foreigners all the way, and now who are we? Who's next? 
mind? Sure, Matthew 25, verses 34 to 40. Then the king will say to the people on his right, Come, you that are blessed by my father, come and possess the kingdom which has been prepared for you ever since the creation of the world. I was hungry, and you fed me, thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you received me in your homes, naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me, in prison, and you visited me. The righteous will then answer him, When, Lord, did we see... Excuse me. When, Lord, did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we ever see you a, a stranger and welcome you into our homes, or naked and clothe you? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? The king will reply, I will tell you, whenever you did this for one of the least important of these members of my family, you did it for me. In the Good News Bible. How's that for a tall order? I remember we, uh, we worked for many years in Africa. And one of the places we worked was at a hospital. And once in a while, they would get bundles of clothes from the United States to distribute. And I mean, every, this is a very rural hospital in a very poor area. You know, everybody would be, you know, really needy. And my wife went down there to talk to the Dorcas lady and said, what do you do? How do you decide? And they, they said, oh, well, it's no problem. We read, they read this verse. So they gave clothes to people who came into the Dorcas Society completely nude. Oh, boy. If they're naked, you give them clothes. Yeah. Now, I don't know how many people took advantage of that, but that's how they decided. Some of you are going to tell me that there is no end to the needs of, in our world. It just seems overwhelming. We do not have the ability that Christ had to walk through the villages and heal every single sick person. We do not have the ability to live through that absolutely horrendous final week of Jesus' life on this earth, which demonstrated the cruelty of Satan and the truth about sin and its results. But God has not given us that challenge. So we don't have to do that. Wouldn't it be possible for us to just pick out one or maybe two individuals and try to reach out to them? Would you dare to pray to ask God to lead you to select some people who need you right now? Would we dare to do that? You may live in an area surrounded by well-to-do people who are quite comfortable. Our lesson today suggests we do this. That's Kerry. I think, yeah. Challenge. Learn about foreigners or non-Christians who live in your country. Joshua Projects. That is a good place to survey. No, that's JoshuaProjects.net. That's a, oh, a website. Yeah, it's that one. Sorry. Is a good place to survey unreached people groups in your culture. And there's the website right there. Okay. Challenge up. Identify someone within your sphere of influence. Begin regularly praying for the person after answering the following questions. Is this person my friend? According to Jesus' model of friendship, do I know the needs of his or her life? How can I lead him or her to Jesus for healing? Okay. Now, some of you are aware that in our community, we now have a religious place of gathering for a completely different religion. Should we be going down there and panic, passing out Sabbath school lessons and so forth? Or food. Hmm? Or food. Or food. Here's an example. Ellen White employed a nurse among her full-time staff. She couldn't always get one, but whenever she could get one, she had one. This was partly because she was constantly reaching out to people who were ill or in need and welcoming them into her household to be cared for until they were better. Sometimes there were 13, 14 people in her house. There are many stories of Jesus. So that's, I mean, that's in our day. 
There are many stories of Jesus reaching out even to people from other cultures and language groups. Dwayne? Mark 5, 1 to 20. Jesus and his disciples arrived on the other side of Lake Galilee in the territory of Gerasa. As soon as Jesus got out of the boat, he was met by a man, or two men, wrote Matthew, who came out of the burial caves there. This man had an evil spirit in him and lived in the tombs, among the tombs. He was some distance away when he saw Jesus, so he ran, fell on his knees before him, and screamed in a loud voice, Jesus, Son of the Most High God, what do you want with me? Okay, I'm going to interrupt there for a second. When he said, Son of the Most High God, who's speaking? Is it the man speaking, or is it the demon inside of him? himself. Leave me alone. <laughs> well, when he said, Son of the Most High God, what's he claiming? He's recognizing that Jesus is a divine being. The devils recognize that, but guess who didn't? Okay, sorry, Duane, go ahead. Right. Um, for God's sake? For God's sake, I beg you, don't punish me. He said this because Jesus was saying, evil spirit, come out of this man. So Jesus asked him, what is your name? The man answered, my name is Mob. There are so many of us. And he kept begging Jesus not to send the evil spirits out of that region. There was a large herd of pigs nearby, feeding on a hillside. So the spirits begged Jesus, send us to the pigs and let us go into them. Now I'm going to interrupt for again a second. Who's speaking now? It sounds like sometimes the man's speaking and sometimes the demons are speaking, isn't it? Oh, yes. Go ahead. He let them go, and the evil spirits went out of the man and entered the pigs. The whole herd, about 2,000 pigs in all, rushed down the side of the cliff into the lake and was drowned. Okay, now, if you knew that 2,000 pigs had just drowned in your water supply, <laughs> and you were a Jew, what would you do? <laughs> Not just if you were a Jew, it's just about anybody. Anybody. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. The men who had been taking care of the pigs ran away and spread the news in the town and among the farms. People went out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who used to have the mob of demons in him. He was sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, and they were all afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the man with the demons and about the pigs. So they asked Jesus to leave their territory. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had had the demons begged him, Let me go with you. But Jesus would not let him. Instead, he told him, Go back home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how kind he has been to you. So the man left and went all through the ten towns, telling what Jesus had done for him, and all who heard it were amazed. Now, the important message to realize that many people don't realize, what, the next time Jesus came to that area, what happened? The, the, five. the whole place came out to see him. Ten, ten towns? Well, the ten towns. It was the ten towns, yeah. Right. A whole, whole bunch of them came out, and he ended up feeding 4,000 men. This was the occasion of the feeding of 4,000. And they came out because of this man's testimony. That's the rest of the story. An evangelist. Okay. Well, they were, he, those two, as far as we know from the scriptures, if, if you only take the scriptures, these were the first Gentile missionaries. Hmm. First missionaries to the Gentiles? Yeah. Hmm. Okay, Gordon. From Ellen White. But the purposes of Christ were not thwarted. He allowed the evil spirits to destroy the herd of swine as a rebuke to those Jews who, who had, is this? Those hmm. Jews who were raising these unclean beasts for the sake of gain. Jews are raising pigs? Can't be. Money. money All the money. money. Yeah. Okay. Had not Christ restrained the demons, they would have plunged into the sea, not only the swine, but also their keepers and owners. The preservation of both the keepers and the owners was due alone to his power, 
mercifully exercised for their deliverance. Okay, so Jesus is casting the demons out of the man and into the pigs. And the demons say, we're going to take keepers and owners, the whole lot of them, along with the pigs, into the water. And Jesus says, no, you're not. So put that whole story together. It's amazing. Okay? The preservation of both the keepers and the owners was due alone to his, that is Christ's power, mercifully exercised for their deliverance. Furthermore, this event was permitted to take place that the disciples might witness the cruel power of Satan upon both man and beast. And though Jesus himself departed, the men so marvelously delivered remained to declare the mercy of their benefactor. Great Controversy 515. And those men became what? Missionaries to the Gentiles of that whole region. Okay, the next Ellen White comment. Men and women are not fulfilling the design of God when they simply express affection for their own family circle while they exclude those for whom, from whom their love, whom they could comfort and bless by their re revealing their necessities. When the Lord bids us to do good for others outside our home, He does not mean that our affection for home shall become diminished and that we shall love our kindred or our county, country less because He desires us to extend our sympathies. But we are not to confirm our affection, confine, confine our affection and sympathy within our walls and to enclose the blessings of God has been given to us so that others will not be benefited with us in its enjoyment. So Ellen White is saying what? He said, bless your, I mean, love your family, take care of them, feed them, etc. Even, you know, friends, but also include whom? The widows and the orphans and the others who don't have, they should be included. Are we prepared to reach out to those who, have not, who, are, who are not in our comfort zone? Oof. In Acts 1.8, the disciples were given a mandate that extends even to us to witness throughout the entire world. And I quote Acts 1.8, But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be filled with power, and you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, and all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Okay, now, what would the members of your church say about Jesus if they heard that he was eating and drinking with gluttons and drink drunkards? Shall I read the verse? Yeah. When the Son of Man came, he, he ate and drank, and everyone said, look at this man. He is a glutton and a, drunker, and a drinker, a friend of tax collectors and other outcasts. God's wisdom, however, is shown to be true by its results. Even Jesus himself was accused of being a drinker. Should Seventh-day Adventists participate in celebrations with non-Adventist groups, even when they are doing certain things with which we are not comfortable? Like what? We're asking some challenging questions here. I can tell you one. I remember as a youngster, we, there was one the village where we were, and then there was a bigger town and we get invited to weddings mm -hmm. some were adventists and some weren't mm -hmm. you know, they didn't get into hooch and go nuts and drunk but it seemed to work okay in some situations i'll never forget it yeah yeah those, those are those are examples i can think of several but we don't have time to stop and talk about them well, let us be honest. There are many, many references, even in the Old Testament, about reaching out to widows, orphans, and foreigners. And look at this conflict, this two verses. Deut Deuteronomy 15.4 says, The Lord your God will bless you in the land that he is giving you. Not one of your people will be poor. Okay? That's Deuteronomy 15. A few verses later, Deuteronomy 15.11, There will always be some Israelites who are poor and in need. 
And so I command you to be generous to them. Is the Bible in contradiction to itself? Well, those are only a few verses apart. Yeah. How do we reconcile that? What's the problem? Do we throw out part of the Bible because it seems to be in contradiction? In essence, the Bible is telling us that because God can provide, he wants to use us in helping those in need and as Jesus did. The biblical tradition as a whole does not regard poverty as a normal part of life, but as an evil exception to the divine plan. What is meant to be normal is the concern that moves people to show kindness to those in need. So what were the Jews supposed to do if somebody was in trouble? Think of the story of Ruth. Yeah. Okay. That's exactly See, who, who, what they did at the Jim? Good Samaritan, too, huh? Yeah. Was that the opposite? Ellen White said, God imparts his blessing to us that we may impart, a, impart to others. Not just to make us rich? Not so far here. When we ask him for the, our daily bread, he looks into our hearts to see if we will share the same th with others, excuse me, with those more needy than ourselves. This business, daily bread, could also be a spiritual food sure. rather than just a, that just a oh, few calories. Preferably both. Yeah. Most of us have full-time jobs doing something which is hopefully beneficial to society. Not many of us have the privilege of traveling around to different villages and cities and reaching out to the neediest and most neglected as Jesus did. To what extent are we to follow his example? Now, we're going to see how, this is my trivia question. Who supported Jesus and his disciples as they traveled around? The women. I heard Gordon mumbling. The women. And how do you know that? I think it's Luke 8, 1, th 1 through 3, isn't it? Luke 8, 1 to 3. They supported him. The rich women. Rich women. Okay. Um, Seventh-day Adventists have always been most successful in evangelizing the poor and needy since it is easier for them to recognize their problems and accept health, help. But Ellen White said that we must also reach out to the rich and successful. Are we doing that? Okay. Mostly not. Carrie, I think you're next. Yes. The intelligent, the refined, are altogether too much passed by. The hook is not baited to catch this class, and ways and methods are not prayerfully devised to reach them with truth that is able to make them wise unto salvation. Most generally, the fashionable, the wealthy, the proud, the un uh, understand rather by experience that happiness is not to be secured by the amount of money that they possess or by costly edifices and ornamental furniture and pictures. They want something they have not. But this class are attracted toward each other and it is hard to find access to them. And because of this, many are perishing in their sins who long for something that will give them rest and peace in quietude of mind. They need Jesus, the light of righteousness. And that's from Ellen G. White Evangelism 5563. Dwayne, you want to take that next one? The life of Christ the Lord of glory is our example. He came from heaven where all was riches and splendor, but he laid aside his royal crown, his royal robe, and clothed his divinity with humanity. Why? That he might meet men where they were. He did not rank himself with the wealthy, the lordly of earth. The mission of Christ was to reach the very poor of earth. You know, I, I don't know if any of you ever had this kind of experience, but you know kids when they're young, they, used, they, they quite often say, well, my dad did this, or my dad does that, or something like that. Did Jesus ever say, my dad is the king of the universe? Did he ever say, you know, the home where I grew up had gold streets. What's with this dirt? <laughs> you know? You don't know. I mean, Jesus could have said all those things. 
Well, but not everybody was happy about the work of Jesus. He was constantly being followed by the religious leaders, particularly the Pharisees, trying to find a way to condemn him. Okay, let's Mark read about one. that. Hmm? Mark 1, 14 and 15. After John had been put in prison, Jesus went to Galilee and preached the good news <clears throat> from God. The right time has come, he said, and the kingdom of God is near. Turn away from your sins and believe the good news from the Good News Bible. Now, here's something very interesting. If you read, if you put the, all four Gospels together, you discover something interesting. Why do you think it was that when John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus moved from his ministry from Judea to Galilee? Later, when John the Baptist was beheaded, he left Galilee to work outside of Jewish territory. Those two are the key signals of did Jesus recognize that things were becoming too difficult and it was time to move on? That could be. We are so fortunate to have the Gospel of Luke. As a Greek physician, he was much more kind in his talking about non-Jews and women. Women were definitely second-class citizens in the society in which Jesus lived. For that reason, Jesus went out of his way to be kind to them and to reach them. He reached out to women who are poor, outcast, sinners, widows, mothers, prostitutes, and otherwise oppressed, even women possessed by the devil. Some of his best friends were possessed by the devil and prostitutes. Jesus had a former devil-possessed prostitute as one of his closest associates, and there's our verse. Maybe we should read it just for sake. Some time later, Jesus traveled to towns and villages preaching the good news about the kingdom of God. Twelve disciples went with him, as so did some women who had been healed of evil spirits and diseases. Mary was called Mary, was called Magdalene, sorry, from whom seven demons had been driven out. Joanna, whose husband Chusa was an officer in Herod's court, and Susanna, and many other women who used their own resources to help Jesus and his disciples. <clears throat> How many is many? More, more than a bunch. How come we don't know about those women? Or even, like we already said, Jesus' sisters. Jesus shocked his disciples by his relationship with the Samaritan woman at Sychar, John 4, 1 to 26 anyway, Bible study comments. The way Jesus handled the situation of the woman caught in the adultery, the situations in many other women indicates his interest in relieving the, and restoring the dignity of women and demonstrates that his love has no preference toward any class of individuals. Look at the following examples of women who were recipients of the Savior's love. The Canaanite Syrophoenician woman. That's what the Lord says, uh, the, no cramps. Or the, she says, yes. even the, even even the dogs, the dogs are, eat the crumbs that fall wow, from the And table. he says, I have not seen faith like this. Among and the what wow. group did this woman belong to? the peoples who were supposed to have been completely destroyed by the children of Israel back when they first came from Egypt. She was a descendant of those people. Wow. Had better faith than the Jews. This mother, John chapter 19, verse 25 to 27, Martha and Mary, whom Jesus encouraged, encountered, uh, and the widow of Nain, whose son Jesus raised from the dead. Jesus was anointed by a sinful woman and forgave her sins. This is, of course, Mary Magdalene, the prostitute. Yeah. Jesus healed and dialogued with a sick woman. Uh, women were cured from evil spirits and diseases by Jesus. Um, Jesus healed a, a crippled woman. Jesus noticed the widow giving her offering. Yeah. Yes, that's Mark 12, 41 to 44. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene, John 20, 10 to 18. Yes. So what are we saying here? 
when the time came for Jesus to give the message that he was risen from the dead, and he wants that message to be carried to the General Conference Committee, who does he sign to carry that message to the General Conference Committee? Mm. But she... The former demon-possessed prostitute. Right, uh, but she, which woman would go out on Sunday morning, of all things, early in the morning? Mm -hmm. I mean, she was... She, she loved was him. there. She, she was him. present. Right, she was present. And the Lord says, leave her alone. She is anointing me for my burial. And everywhere the gospel is preached, this story is going to be told. How beautiful. Yep. Consider especially the cha this challenging story about Mary Magdalene. If you look at, if you follow her whole story through and you, you read the things from Ellen White, you know she was the niece of Simon, yes. who apparently led her into sin when she was still a young woman. And then the family probably rejected her because of that experience. And so she fled to Magdala, and that's how she came, became called, Amen. came to be called Mary Magdalene. And how did she support herself in Magdala? Mm prostitution. Consider especially this story. It is one of the final stories about Jesus and women. It appears in John 20, 10 to 11, 18, and that, of course, is the story of Jesus rising from, the, from this tomb, and the first person that he talks to is Mary. Mary Magdalene. And he says, don't hang on to me. I have to go to my father. I'll be... I mean, if here was, yeah, what were we going to say? Oh, here was a person who had just risen from the dead, probably glorified with a glorified body. Would you dare to touch him? She didn't care. Well, see, what the story of those days, of course, was that greetings took a while. You know, this, and, and I mean, this is still true in some parts of the world where, where I was. Um, I hadn't seen some people I had worked with for a while went off to get to get an education from Africa to the Philippines and they were attending school in the Philippines and my wife and I came there because they asked my wife from, from the School of Nursing here to go over there and teach us some classes for the School of Nursing over there for a couple of weeks when, they, when these people from Africa who we'd worked with before saw us they said come to our house we went and visited their house, we, and we lived a half a mile, I mean, we were staying a half a mile away. They escorted us all the way from their house all the way down to our house because that's the polite thing to do. You talk, you, that's, that's the way it is in some parts of the world. Well, why do you suppose Jesus, the Son of God, chose to send the gospel message of his resurrection, and we just mentioned this, to the General Conference Committee by using a woman known to be a former prostitute and sinner? Jesus seemed to go out of his way to reach, heal, and save people who were despised by the Jewish nation. Yeah. Okay, here's another part of that story. A Pharisee, this is Luke 7, 36 to 50, Simon. a Pharisee invited Jesus, and who was the Pharisee? Simon. Simon. Invited Jesus to have a dinner with him, and Jesus went to his house and ate, sat down to eat. In that town was a woman who lived a sinful life. She heard that Jesus was eating to the Pharisee's house, so she brought an alabaster jar full of perfume and, since before, and stood behind Jesus by his feet, crying and wetting his feet with her tears. Then she dried her, his feet with her hair, kissed them, and poured the perfume on them. When the Pharisee saw this, he said to himself, if this man really were a prophet, he would know who this woman is who is touching him. He wouldn't know what kind of sinner she li sinful life she lives. Simon was both a Pharisee and a leper. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Yes, teacher, he said, to, he said tell me. There were two men who owed money to a money lender. Jesus began. One owed him 500 silver coins, the other owed him 50. Neither of them could pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Which one, then, will love him more? I suppose, answered Simon, that it would be the one who was given, forgiven more. You are right, said, said Jesus. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your home, and you gave me no water from, from my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You did not welcome me with a kiss, but she has not stopped kissing my feet since I came. You provided me no olive oil from my head, but she has covered my feet with perfume. 
I tell you then, the great love she has shown, she has shown proves that her many sins have been forgiven. But whoever has been forgiven little shows only a little love. And guess who would it be that's only showing a little love? Yeah. Hmm. And Jesus said to the woman, and we know it's Mary Magdalene, your sins are forgiven. The others sitting at the table began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And we've heard that story already, haven't we? Yeah. <laughs> but Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Compare Mark 14. But there's more to this story. Jim? From Ellen White, Christ might be, excuse me, Christ might have extinguished every spark of hope in Mary's soul, but he did not. <laughs> the heart searcher read the motives that led her to her actions, and he also saw the spirit that prompted Simon's words. See the thou this woman? He said to him, she is a sinner. I say unto thee, the, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but you whom little but, is, me, but, to whom? but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said to her, thy sins are forgiven. Those present, thinking Lazarus, who had been raised from the dead by Christ, and who was at that time a guest in his uncle's house, began to question, saying, who is that, excuse me, who is this that forgiveth sins also? Jesus answered, excuse me, Jesus Christ, but Christ continued, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. Ellen White, Signs of the Times, May 9, and 1900. What's, yeah, what's the Hebrew for Christ? Christos? Messiah. Messiah. The Messiah. Since Mary, Magdal Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were siblings, then Simon was Mary's uncle, and he's the one who led her into sin. Simon had led into sin the woman he now despised. She had been deeply wronged by him. But Simon felt himself more righteous than Mary, and Jesus desired him to see how great his guilt really was. He would show him that his sin was greater than hers. And we need to close there. We hope you got the whole picture. God bless you. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we see what an incredible example you were when you were here on this earth. This, this, the links you went to reach out to sinners just beyond belief. Lord, we know there are a lot of sinners among, we are among all among them here. We, we need to realize the incredible love that you showed to them. Help us to realize how much love you exhibited to us. May we be forgiven as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.